Because these plants, what they're doing is they're out-competing the native species. Now, I went to a lecture on, on uh, forest forensics uh, given by some guy who's touted to be, you know, really the second coming. And, um, and I asked him about invasive species, and he told me not to worry about them, that in the next 50 or 60,000 years, the invasive species will all die off, and the native species will be back, and it's nothing to worry about. All I need to wait is 50 or 60,000 years. We're safe. So it's okay. So the chestnut will come back, the elm will come back, that, that evolution will, the, these plants will evolve to fight uh, the fungus or the, the, the bacteria that's, that's killing them. So that, that made me feel a little better. Uh, but the plants that we see in here that we start with is, uh, as far as invasive species go, so this is privet, um, which is, uh, you know, most people, uh, no, excuse me, this is Euonymus, um, which is the burning bush that you see in every parking lot of every mall that you've ever been to. They have burning bush. In the fall, it turns that bright, bright red color, and it's gorgeous. But it produces a berry, and the birds love to eat the berries, and they eat them, and then they fly around, and they plant the seeds all over the place. And so burning bush, Euonymus, um, uh, winged Euonymus, is, is uh, one of the big invasive species in the area. Um, and they call it winged Euonymus because if you look at the bark, um, it has an aeroplane-like wing coming, growing out of the green twig bark, this quirky uh, appendage, which protects it from a browser's coming, deer coming to eat it. Deer don't like to eat things that are rough feeling or prickly or fuzzy or smell funky. Deer are particular about what they eat. They'll eat almost anything that's native and if it's an invasive species they don't like it. It's going to take them maybe uh, a couple of hundred years before they learn to, to have a, a taste for it. Um, it's sort of like me and sushi. I'm just like this with sushi right now. So the last 15 years I've been trying it but I still think of it as bait. Um, so the, these are uh, some of the invasive species. Now this is one of the plants that's green and leafy that isn't an invasive species. It's one of my favorite plants in the whole wide world. It's skunk cabbage. You've all smelled skunk cabbage, right? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. No, it's good. It's, <laughs> listen, it's, it smells a little funky, okay? But, but it's... It, it will, you can hand it around. I'm not going to. Yeah, you can smell it. Now, I know some of you are going like, oh, it smells kind of funky and gross, and I don't like it, but I do. <laughs> because this reminds me when you walk around it and you bruise it, it you get that smell. And I kind of like that smell because it reminds me of being a kid monkeying around in streams and creeks and picking up frogs and salamanders and things like that, which is what I like to do as a kid. Skunk cabbage is a really neat plant because when it grows, in the early spring when the ground is frozen, now last year when we did this walk, the ground was still frozen. Mm -hmm. um, and we had so much snow. Remember last year how snowy it was? If you were a Pace student last year, you survived the worst winter I can remember. This year was the easiest winter that I can remember. Well, this plant actually grows so fast that it generates heat. And it generates heat and, and it melts the snow and ice around it. And it, when it flowers early in the season, it, it has a flower that it's called foidides. Foi, fo, yeah, foidides. And it, 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 it stinks like rotten meat. And it attracts beetles that are up and, and, and working around in the area to come to pollinate it. Now, down here I have maple trees. This is a Norway maple tree. And uh, if it's left alone, it'll grow to be a maple tree. But probably the woodchucks and the deer and what have you are going to eat this. This is tender. You know, this is sort of like going to the um, salad bar and getting tender leafy greens. This is good stuff for the deer. Um, this is a young plant called jewelweed, which the deer have just started in the last two years on this property. They started eating it. Do you know why they call it jewelweed? It doesn't look like a jewel, does it? But if you put it under water, if you step up on the bridge, if you put this under water, you'll see it, it takes like it, it, it's been touched with, um, uh, what's the, mer mercury. It looks like mercury underwater. And it, it'll shine and it gets this iridescence. Do you see that? Yeah. And um, jewelweed is supposedly the cure for poison ivy. It's a succulent plant. And um, the juice that comes out of it can be used to, to rub it on poison ivy and it supposedly cures poison ivy. Now, I wouldn't know. I don't catch poison ivy, so 
Yeah, that's neither here nor there. Another invasive species, Japanese barberry. Barbarous thumberjai. And um, it's uh, uh, another ornamental plant that's escaped. And it, it, it's probably one of the more aggressive invasive species in, in a forested area. Mm -hmm. It can grow underneath the canopy of trees and it can take the, the uh, shade a lot better than, mo than most of the native plants. Now, since we were here, I've been listening to that cardinal. Breeding season for cardinals. Cool thing about cardinals, male and females both talk. And that's very rare. In most birds, it's the male that does all of the singing and the female's kind of quiet. But with the cardinals, they both say poison ivy. And uh, poison ivy is, is, you can catch poison ivy winter, spring, summer, and fall. I don't think you, it's it's just one time a year. It's a, all, all, all the time of the year you can catch it. But ash trees are all dying from the, what they call the ash yellows, and nobody knows why. Um, there is an ash borer, but it's not really the, the culprit that's killing them. Uh, my personal feeling is it's earthworms that are doing it, uh, but that's my theory. Um, it hasn't been proven yet, but I think it's the earthworms uh, that are killing the trees because we're losing the, the soil in our forests because there are too many worms. And I know all of you are scratching your head going, I thought earthworms were good. Not necessarily. Earthworms are not native to this area or haven't been native to this area for millions of years. And it's only in the last 400 years that earthworms have been introduced to this area since the, you know, when, when shipping, when, when the pilgrims came over and they broke the the, the keels of the ship or both soil, that's how earthworms were reintroduced because this area was compacted for, you know, thousands and thousands of years by glaciers and uh, the, the tonnage of ice squished all of the earthworms to death and so there weren't any and the, uh, and the trees evolved without having earthworms around and now if you dig down under this ground, I guarantee you on a warm day, not today, on a, but if you look at the soil, I could just reach in here and this is all worm castings. It's all worm castings. They're supposed to be six inches of leaves and then leaf litter and then hum uh, humus and then subsoil and then, you know, excuse me, soil and then subsoil. It, we have a little bit of worm casings on top and then it goes right to subsoil. Six inches below this, it's subsoil. And, and all of the nutrients are being leached out of the system. Heavy rain comes, washes the nutrients into the stream, into the pond. We have an algae bloom, and that's that. How many of you live in Westchester, Rockland, or Putnam County? And you see all of the stone walls when you're walking through the woods? Do you know who you can thank for that? Napoleon Bonaparte. Yep. If it wasn't for Napoleon Bonaparte, you wouldn't have stone walls all throughout New England. But because when Napoleon Bonaparte invaded Spain and Portugal, um, he brought sheep out of Spain and Portugal called merino sheep and there was this merino wool phenomena that happened in the early uh, uh, late 18th century in the United States uh, they smuggled out these these sheep and and everywhere in New England wherever you see stone walls that was probably it was land that was cleared for sheep and um, before that, the, the people kept those sheep, you know, these merino sheep a secret because the wool is so fine. I love, mer how many of you have ever worn merino oh, wool yeah. socks? It makes a huge difference. The difference between itchy, crappy wool socks and merino wool socks is a huge difference. That's why you're paying $14 a pair of socks. Um, so if it wasn't for uh, them smuggling those sheep out because they were kept as a secret, you know, they were really, you know, kept, it was a prized possession of Portugal. They were not going to give up those sheep. And uh, then everyone in the United States, there was thousands and thousands. At one time, I think somebody said in 18, 1810, there was like 40,000 sheep in New England. And by 1880, there was like 45 million sheep in New England. So that really, the sheep industry was huge. And that's where all of these stone walls were built. They weren't built to keep cattle in, they were built to keep sheep in. And all of the trees were gone, 
because they burned them. They burned them for coal, they burned them for um, um, lime, the lime kilns in this area, the, 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 and for homes. New York State Forest is 80 years old, um, which is relatively young. Uh, but it's, it's heading to be a mature forest. But in this area, it's been disturbed so many times. Uh, this is probably the thir third or fourth forest in this area, uh, depending on how long the Dutch have been here. This is garlic mustard, another invasive species. Um, it, 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 it's already flowering. You know, it's grown this tall from the ground up this tall already this year. This one's growing here and, and so high because it, it's using the, um, the tree as a solar warmer. Mm. This tree faces directly south and it's warming this area. It's got its own little microclimate. So if you look over there, it's nowhere near ready to bloom. But right here, this, sun, this tree is absorbing sunlight and warmth all spring long. And it, it's causing this little microclimate right here. Garlic mustard is supposedly edible. Very few plants in nature that I eat. This tastes disgusting. Yeah. Um, I like garlic and mustard. I don't like this. Uh, a lot of people use this as an ornamental hedge. It's privet. Um, it's a European privet. It was introduced to this area. Um, it produces a nice thick green uh, uh, hedge if you shear it. it it's, a, it's a nice thing to block your neighbors. Um, it doesn't have thorns, which I, I, I appreciate plants that don't have thorns. If it has thorns or stickers, I'm not a big fan of it. Um, this is multiflora rose, another invasive species. Excuse me. What was that? Oh, look. What is that? It's a wild cat with a baby rabbit in its mouth. Wild cat? Yeah. Not a bobcat. Just a big. It's. Oh, I see. It. Yeah. Might have had a vole in its mouth. Might have been a vole. Cheapers. Okay. <laughs> I wish I'd gotten but, it. But that was, that's a, what do I say, a wild cat. It's a domestic cat. There were no, you know, uh, house cats in the United States. They're not a native species, but these cats are what we call feral. College students brought them here years ago. They took care of them for a little while, and their mom and dad said, no, you can't have a cat. Out the door they went. Well, those cats now live here in a wild population, but they're horribly destructive to the environment. Um, they kill thousands and thousands of songbirds a year. A lot of, I used to, this area used to be sick with rabbits. We had rabbits all over the place. How many of you have seen a rabbit on campus? Not many, not many. Uh, I see them once in a blue moon, once in a blue moon. I used to catch 30 or 40 rabbits a year uh, with my hawks when I was hunting here. Now, I didn't hurt the population of rabbits, but what happens is these feral cats they'll wipe out nest after nest after nest of, of baby rabbits because the mother and the rabbit basically in an area like this would just pull out her hair, cover it over with grass, have her babies, and then twice a day come in, feed the babies, clean them up, and leave. But leave those little, you know, little piglets in there. And the cats come along and just eat every single one of them. And, uh, so the cats are beautiful animals, but they belong indoors. They don't belong here. Is there any effort to... The university, when there was a lot of rabies in the area, uh, trapped, some, trapped a lot of them. But, you know, it's only as good as the effort you put in. And by the way, did you notice the coloring on that cat? Yeah. That cat didn't look like your typical house no. cat, did it? No. That's probably fourth or fifth generation of wild. living in the wild. And that fourth or fifth generation is now it's beginning to revert to more of a wild state. It looks like a wild cat. Um, and and it's, it's, it's kind of sad. Its life expectancy is probably about a year and a half, two years. Uh, now, in your house, your cat should live to be like 15, 18 years old. This area here um, is the drainage for the parking lots up above. The hot water that runs off of the parking lot, which in the summertime, it could be 80 degrees, 90 degree water. Comes in here and it settles out. A lot of the, um, the garbage, uh, and James, I think you cleaned up most of the garbage in here. There's probably 100 soda bottles, beer bottles, and coffee cups in here. Um, everything you leave in the parking lots ends up either here or in the pond. Mm -hmm. 
and this cools it down, takes some of the oil that's in it, lets it settle out, and then it goes down into my stream down below. Um, and and uh, I'm not really fond of it, but I guess it works. By the way, do you hear that bird in the distance? That is going. It's a white-throated sparrow. And some people say it's saying sweet Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. If you're from Canada, you believe it's saying, oh, Canada, Canada, Canada. Mm -hmm. Depends who you are. The white flowering plant here, there he is. That is shadbush. Good, he answered back. I like that. Uh, white throated sparrow, yep. This is shadbush, and they say if you want to fish for shad in the Hudson River, when you see the shad bush blooming, you should go to the river and fish for shad. Shad industry was huge in this area. It was a, a food fish. Uh, but when GE dumped the PCBs into the Hudson River, it took the shad away from all of us. So we don't eat shad. You don't go, you know, you, go, you guys eat tilapia. You know, you go to a restaurant, oh man, I want tilapia. Tilapia is garbage fish. They, they're they're farm-raised garbage fish. Um, and, and we should be eating shad and striped bass and bluefish from the Hudson River, but we can't. That right was taken away from you 50 years ago, 75 years ago, and, and we probably will never get to eat them again. Are they in other rivers? Yeah, they're in uh, Delaware. Um, and um, the Houston no. tonic, but not much. What does this plant look like to y'all? Bamboo. It looks like bamboo, and it's called Japanese bamboo, but it's not. It's a polygnum. And a polygnum is a type of uh, knotweed. And um, right now, it's just beginning to grow. This will grow 14 feet tall every year. It, it grows, grows the same height every year. Here it is right here, beginning to grow. And they say at this stage, it tastes like asparagus. And I don't know. I like asparagus, but I don't know if I, I want to venture to eat this. But this is, a, it's hollow, but each time you come to a ring here, and here, and here, it's got a, a quirky, um, but look at all the moisture. Now, when was the last time it rained? A while ago. A while ago, right? But look at all of the moisture that's inside this plant. It's pretty cool, right? It, it, it's really neat. And, um, and I'll try. A little lemony. Um, I wouldn't recommend eating it. I don't know if it's poisonous or not. It's you're, you're experimental. <laughs> let's, let's not try on you. Did it burn? <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. It doesn't taste like asparagus. Though. I was told it did, but it doesn't. Is that the ra is that the raspberry that's coming out right there, Jim? This with the red bark. Where? On your right, here. Uh -oh. This stuff right here. No, uh, no, no, no that's multiflora rose multiflora again. Multiflora rose, okay. And we do have raspberries. Uh, lots and lots of raspberries. Yeah, that wasn't bad tasting. But we'll keep an eye on it. This is this is raspberry here. Yeah. It, this is a type of raspberry that's it's not a red raspberry. Um, it's not a black raspberry. It's it's really they call it a wine berry. Uh, it, it's kind of like a red raspberry. It tastes like a red raspberry. It looks a little bit like a red raspberry, but um, it's also a pretty tough species as far as being an invasive species. Um, it is not, invasive. It's not the native one. And, um, and if you look here, all of this is invasive species, with the exception of the two elm trees uh, and the poison ivy growing up at the hairy vine poison ivy. Um, and the white throated sparrow is definitely here to kick my butt. He's mad at me. And that species is probably the most stupid thing that human beings could do. It's a waste of time and effort. It's like putting toothpaste back in the tube. You know, uh, it comes in the tube, it's a wonderful thing, but trying to put it back in there is a real pain in the ass. You can't get rid of these invasive species because. Um, it's going to take thousands of years for them to evolve out of favor. And they will. Um, poison ivy grows straight up the tree, so it doesn't choke the tree. 
and it'll, it'll grow in a relatively straight line. But you see the invasive plants wrap around the tree and girdle it and kill it. So sooner or later, as you drive up and down the Saw Ro the Sawmill River Parkway, you'll see tons and tons and tons of vineage growing up in the trees. And those are uh, porcelain berries. Those porcelain berries are going to kill all of those trees. Now, once those trees are all dead and they're laying spraddled on the ground, um, the porcelain berry is not going to have that advantage yeah. anymore to grow up. So another species is going to come over and, and take over for that. So eventually, they're going to evolve to grow straight up a tree and not kill their host because killing your host is stupid. Uh, if you're an invasive species, you don't want to kill your host. And that's what a lot of in invasive species do. They change the habitat in such a way that they kill their host. Now, last year when I came up here, I had field mice living in here. And I'm pretty sure I don't any longer. There were field mice living in here. Mice. But they're not in here now. Maybe they'll move back in. Maybe they won't. Maybe that cat ate them. Uh, but they were, it was kind of nice. I used to come up here every other day and give them a little piece of milk bone dog biscuit. And it was kind of nice to have them here. Is that Jim or is that? Huh? Just waiting. This flower, it's, it's on most of our lawns. If you take mm -hmm. care of a lawn, this is called Gill Over the Ground or Creeping Charlie. It's a mint. Any plant that has a square stem and a purple flower, bluish flower, I'm kind of on my color, so I'm not sure what color that is. Um, this is in the mint family. And um, so if you, if you roll it around, you'll see it has a square stem. Square stems, purple flowers, aromatic leaves. If you say it's a mint, 9.9 9 .9 times out of 10, you're going to be right. So you can tell people, oh, that's in the mint family. It so smells minty. Yeah. Um, gill over the ground. It's got, got a fragrance. I personally don't like it. But again, multiflora rose. Um, this is um, another invasive species. This is a Japanese honeysuckle. Um, so we've got an invasive species climbing on an invasive species. guys got the email about the coyote on campus. I'm sorry about that. Charlie's dad. Huh? Charles' that dad, dad did send it out. Oh. Charles okay. Link. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry about that. Um, you know, that coyote, he got, you know, people saw him a couple, two, three times. Coyotes have lived on this campus that I know of since 1992. Uh, and they've been good neighbors. They haven't came down, they've never killed a chicken or a goat or a sheep or anything like that. Some of the neighborhood dogs came here once and ate three of my, well, didn't eat, but they killed three of my sheep and, and two of my goats, uh, jumped in the pen and killed them. Uh, but the coyotes never did that. It was a, a yellow lab and a golden retriever. They're not, they weren't vicious dogs, they were everybody's pet. When you let your dog out and you don't watch where he's going, you know, it's natural for a dog to chase an animal. And if the animal runs, they chase it. And if it runs and they can catch it, instinct takes over. Uh, your house dog is 99% wolf. And what happens is it remembers in the, in, in the gray matter, way back in its brain, it says, use my canines to open up their belly. And they disembowel whatever the sheep or goats are. And then they start, you know, they might eat a little bit. They eat a little bit. And I came in one day and I've got three sheep that are laying there. And one little goat looks at me and goes, me. I was like, oh, oh, little Mandy was a little baby goat. I felt horrible. But it wasn't the coyotes that did it. The coyotes showed up and a couple of people saw it. And, and then all of a sudden, it went from two or three people seeing it to everybody on campus has seen this coyote. I mean, everybody's seen this coyote. 99% of them are full of man manure. You know, they didn't see the coyote. They just want to be part of it. Um, the coyotes are, you know, they're, they're nice animals. If you leave them alone, they'll leave you alone. If a coyote stands its ground and doesn't run away from you, my advice and the advice of the DEC is pick up a rock and a stick and throw it at it and yell at it. You don't want the coyotes to become habituated. The one that's coming up behind the dorm, he's there for a reason. There's rats and mice and squirrels attracted to your litter. You've all seen squirrels coming in and out of the dumpsters, right? 
and out of the garbage oh, goes. Well, there and raccoons. Well, that's those are all those. That's like McNuggets to a coyote. A raccoon is a McNugget. It's just uh, or a cat is something. You know, that's just like a tasty thing to eat. So, the I cat. huh? The cat. Oh, they'll eat cat. Yeah, there was one woman in Rye two years ago. Don't videotape this. She let her little lasso up so well. It's getting harder and harder for me to find small branches of it. Um, so I doubt I'll be able to do this. Um, so I'll take a little piece here. Pass that around and smell it. If you know what it is, don't tell me. Don't tell anybody else. But what does it smell like to you? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. It smells very familiar. No, nope, not mint. Hey, what's up? It smells like a candy. Yeah, we're on the nature trail. Pass it around. Good yeah. Hit. It's a good smell. Deacon. Um, we're no, no, by the parking green. lot above the library. When I say it, you'll go, oh, yeah. Toothpaste. No, not toothpaste. All right, but just, um. No, not spearmint. Yeah. We'll, we'll find you on the nature. I thought it was root beer. It is root beer. It smells like that. Mm -hmm. Root beer. Root right. beer. Yeah, birch beer, beer and root beer. This is a birch tree. This one here is a European birch tree. Um, but this is the Native American birch tree. Do you see what's happening here right now? Oh, sap. The sap see, is sap? running. Come and take a look at the sap running out of this. It's like tapping a maple tree. The sap is running down this, and you can make a syrup out of this, the birch beer syrup, or root beer syrup. It's very much like molasses. And root beer before Coca-Cola was the number yeah. one soda in the United States. Coca-Cola became popular because they added cocaine to it, and what the heck, mm -hmm. you know, anything with cocaine in it back in the eight, 1880s is a good thing to have. Um, made you feel good when you drank it. Okay. It's like neat. A lot um, better now so this is kind of sweet, there. and the birch tree, um, this sap, well, the insects will come here, and woodpeckers might come and eat the insects, but this is a, a, a gray or a river birch. This is um, a European birch tree. I don't know the name of it. Does it taste? It looks like the white birch. It doesn't have a great taste. No? Nope. Or a great smell. Um, and if you're looking yeah. here, you see that? The vine, the vine yeah. has grown around this tree here. Mm. Well, look at what's happened. Mm. You see these knots yeah, fused, around yeah. it? And that's going to happen here on this birch tree. Remember I was talking before about invasive yeah. species. That's a honeysuckle growing up that tree, and it's going to choke that tree. It's going to kill it. Is that and uh, you can see the twisted, yeah. the twisted vine. What it's going to do is it's going to cut off the cambium layer. So what happens is... It's not, you're not going to have the up the xylem down the phloem. The moisture won't be able to go up the tree. If you kill a cambium layer, if I took my knife and, and went around bit, yeah. this tree and cut the bark around this tree in about a half inch wide swath, I would kill a tree. That's called girdling a tree. It's a nice way to kill a tree slowly. Um, and then they planted these, um, uh, birch. The, yeah, these paper. kind of weird funky birch. They're not really paper not birch. Paper? No, they're, uh, they call them river birch. Oh, uh, but yeah. um, they're, they're, don't like I it? don't know what diseases came in on that birch that might affect these birches. So, what is that birch? This is the, the one with the sap is called the black birch. Black, black, black birch. birch. Yep. And I love them. And you know, you can chew on the twigs. There's a, uh, a plant over here. I'll show you. <laughs> They, they love to build buildings and they're going to put dormitories up and all. But this area here is home to so many um, wild birds. We have all sorts of cat birds and cardinals and, and chickadees and titmice and, and woodpeckers and, and warblers. We have summer warblers in here, yellow rumped warblers, pine warblers, all nesting in this area. Because these invasive species, they do have some benefits. It's great habitat for nesting. Uh, it's thick cover, um, and and they can you know put their nests in here, and it, it's really a, a diverse area. Um, this is a grapevine, um, a, a native wild grape, um, which and, and you come up here, and, and and David knows you come up here in September and October, and the smell of the wild grapes, it's it's like opening. A, 
a grape soda. It smells better than grape soda. It's like, you know, you just want to eat them. They don't taste all that great, but they smell wonderful. Just, there used to be a lot more of it on campus, and it's getting less and less all the time. How many of you like Fruit Loop cereal? Do you remember Fruit Loop cereal? Who doesn't? This like smells it? like Fruit Loops. Um, this is um, sassafras, and it was the number one exported crop back to Europe when the pilgrims were in, um, and it smells, well, not exactly. Early in the season, it doesn't smell exactly like Fruit Loops, but it smells a little bit like Fruit Loops. Yeah, that's kind of nice. Now, the thing is, sassafras was made out of, uh, sa sarsaparilla soda was made out of sassafras. And what they found out is that it's a carcinogen. Oh. So those of you chewing it, it's a carcinogen. But you'd have to eat, you'd have to eat tons and tons and tons Every of day. it. Every um, day. And, and it, it, it's not going to kill you. Um, these so, are all planted trees, are they not? The, I planted all of these trees here. Uh, all of the pine trees you see here, I planted. I got them as saplings. And um, stuck in some thorns here. Uh oh. It's okay. It's far from my heart. Um, so this is this is the sassafras tree here, and the willow is uh, the birch is growing over it. And then I have a Norway. Spruce. When he got there, he became the highway superintendent, and he along the. Uh, the roadways in, in Larchmont, he saw all of these dead pine trees. So he had his guys go out and cut them all down. And what it was is that it was these larch trees that lose their needles every year. Oh, yeah. They lose their needles, and he thought they were dead pine trees. And they, they grow new, fresh needles every spring. So these bright green ones here are the fresh needles. Mm -hmm. And um, so Larchmont, there for a while, didn't have these big larch trees that it was named after. There's a lot of religious symbolism in the dogwood. My mother told me a story when I was a little boy. She said, you know, do you know why dogwoods never grow big and tall and straight? And I said, no, Mom, why? And she says, well, because when they made the, the uh, crucifix for Christ, when they crucified Christ, they made it out of dogwoods. Dogwoods used to grow large and straight, and they made the, the, the cross for Christ out of dogwood. And since then, it, the trees grow nothing but small and twisted. You could never build a decent crucifix out of a dogwood nowadays. So she says, and, and not only that, but the flower of the dogwood, there's four leaves. It's in the shape of a cross, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, at each end of each leaf, when this is in full bloom, there's a hole through the leaf and a blood spot where, where Christ was pierced. Uh, the crown of thorns, uh, uh, the nails for his hands and the nail for his foot, and then the crown of thorns in the center. So it's just one of those little tales that I was told as a child that I remember gave the dogwood tree a lot of, uh, you know, uh, meaning for me. Uh, and it gave a story that is sort of like the reason I had you smell the birch and taste the sassafras and, and do that is because it gives it value. If it has value, you'll appreciate it. And that's why you're here at Pace University. You're here to get an education because if you're educated, you'll care. If you'll care, you'll protect. And that's basically all we could ask for is that you, we try to do a better job protecting the environment. So the dogwood tree, Cornus floridia, and I always remember Cornus because that's the, the Latin name for dogwoods, is Cornus, Cornus cusa, Cornus floridia, uh, has an alligator shaped bark. And alligators come from Florida, so Cornus floridia, that's my Years way. Years ago, I had a butterfly garden here, and these guys, these are uh, daffodils, these are doubles. And um, they're really, they're kind of neat looking daffodils and I should dig them up and put them back in the garden. But when they, when they put the parking lot up in this area, I let the butterfly garden go. And, and I don't really have time to take care of it anyway. So. But th these are the only guys that hung tough. Oh, that and these onions. <laughs> these are Globemaster onions. And they're supposed to, the flower on these Globemasters gets this big. They're really gorgeous. Um, and I should take these up and put them down in my, my deer resistant garden, but that's a black capped chickadee, which is my all time favorite bird in the whole wide world. Black capped chickadee is going. My mother used to say, oh, it's talking to you. It's going, Jimmy, Jimmy. All winter long, the black capped chickadee goes chickadee, chickadee, dee, dee, chickadee, chickadee, dee, dee. Springtime, 
in February and March in this area, you'll hear the and that's the beginning of the, hey, you know, hey, babe, I'm looking for you. And they call back and forth to each other. Now, he's going to come close because he thinks I'm in his territory. And I'm a good enough imitator that he's probably pretty close here. And he's going to check me out to make sure I'm not a threat to his girlfriend. Okay, so I like chickadees. Um, I shot a grouse in the woods behind my parents' house when I was a boy. I was hunting for grouse. Um, and, and I shot a grouse with a double barrel shotgun. And boom, the smoke was still coming out of the barrel, curling out of the barrel of the shotgun. And a chickadee landed on the end of the barrel, right on the bead of the shotgun, and looked at me and went chickadee, chickadee, dee, basically like saying, wow, that's so loud and rude. You know, and I looked at that little brass. I, I really, for a millisecond, I thought, ah, I'll shoot the other trigger off. Just, pfft, little feathers go. But I admire the, the, the panache of that little bird to sit there and look at me and go, who the are you to make so much noise in my forest? <laughs> and, and ever since then, I've loved chickadees. They've been my, my all-time favorite bird. And I could sit out here with some um, sunflower seeds in my hand, and they'll come and eat them right out of my hands. They have no fear of you. You know, they don't, they don't care. Uh, they see those sunflowers and they're going to come and get them. So I like them a lot. Uh, so that's that's who's talking there. Um, this is not poison ivy. This is Virginia creeper. It looks like poison ivy, which was growing up here. This is poison ivy. Leaflets of three, leave it be. Um, nice, red, shiny, waxy poison ivy. Its Latin name used to be Rus radicans, and now it's, I don't know what it is anymore. Damn botanists changed the name on it, and I hate that. Why do scientists do that? Variety. A variety. Just to make sure we're all on the Jim, do we have a living space here? For, uh, in here, yeah, yeah. There, underneath this rock is um, uh, woodchucks live under here. Oh, how many so, chucks? So, uh, the, there's something down there, there too. Yeah, yeah there's okay. underneath here is woodchucks living under here. Now, now the woodchucks, sometimes they get booted out by cats. Which is tough because woodchucks are some tough sons of guns. Yeah. Um, when I first started working here, Angelo Spillo, the director of the Environmental Center, told me about the dog that used to live here on the campus. His name was Jake. And he said Jake was the toughest, snarliest dog he'd ever seen in his life. He said this dog would tackle anything. Another dog came on the property. Jake was there to kick its butt. And um, one day Jake saw a woodchuck and the woodchuck saw Jake and they both knew that they weren't going to be able to make it to cover in time and they both charged each other and they fought and, and he said it looked like you know like a, the Tasmanian devil is just like whoa fur going here and there and then the dog ended up here and the woodchuck ended up here and they both just walked away from each other knowing that you know they, they could they threw each other a bad enough beating that you know the dog said, I'm not going to with that anymore. And the woodchuck was like, well, I'm not messing with that dog anymore. But that's how tough woodchucks are. Uh, I could see some woodchucks down right now in my, my pasture where my goats and sheep are. Uh, we'll, we'll be able to get closer to them. They're pretty complacent. They're one of the few true hibernating mammals in Westchester County. There's only three hibernating mammals. The little brown bat, the chipmunk, and the woodchuck. How are our bats doing? Bats are doing horribly. Really? Horribly. They do have the white nose thing? Yep. Every big colony that I know. Now, here at Pace, underneath the shutters and in my bat box, we have a healthy, you know, colony of bats living here. Good. But but in all of the caves in this area, the uh, that white nose disease, the mm. fungus, is, is really a problem. Mm. If you look at the vines growing up this tree here, that's Bauer actininia, which is a hairless kiwi. Kiwi fruit that you buy at the grocery store, which is very pretty in your salads and tastes like nothing. Everyone says, oh no, it tastes like a combination of a strawberry and a, uh, a banana. Styrofoam. And it does, a kiwi, those yeah. furry fruits with the neat seeds yeah. in them. This is a hairless kiwi and it only grows about this big, about as big as a large mm -hmm. grape. But it is as sweet as any candy you've ever had. It's delicious. The bad thing is, you have to be a monkey to climb up there to get them. You need a now the woodchucks, yeah. they know about it, and they know how good it is. And in the fall, when the, it frosts once or twice, the kiwi on the vine ferments, and it, it must turn into a, a narcotic or an alcohol. 
because the woodchucks come up here and they eat them. And I was sitting here when I used to be a cigarette smoker. I was sitting on the stone wall one day having a cigarette smoke. Uh, this is 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And I watched this woodchuck and he's climbing up there. All of a sudden he falls down, boom, and he hits the ground and he's walking like this. And I was like, oh, the poor woodchuck, you know, he's got nerve damage, you know. He's, and then I look over there and there's another woodchuck and he's walking. They were absolutely schnockered. They were drunk as skunks. And because of the, the either the narcotic effect or the uh, alcohol effect of the, the Bauer Actinidia, which is really neat. It happens every every November, right after the first or second hard frost. It, it happens every year. The woodchucks come up here and get hammered. And uh, it also happens with the uh, cedar waxwings. Beautiful little birds. Um, and people bring him in to me and they go, he can't fly. And I said, no, he's all messed up, man. He shouldn't fly. He knows better. <laughs> you know, he's totally trapped. So you keep him for 48 hours, you let him sober up, and they're ready to go. But every year, people will bring me three or four cedar wax wings that are all drugged up. And, and uh, the uh, Have any of you ever hiked the north woods of Maine or Vermont? Okay, if you ever get a chance to do it, <laughs> When you go out in Maine and Vermont, you'll see all of these big trees laying down on the ground, and, and they, they're, they're big snags with sharp, jagged branches. If you have to go off the trail and go through the woods, it's dangerous because those trees are they're like spear points, and they don't decay because there's no termites. Here, these logs, within a few years, these logs are going to be gone. Between the carpenter ants and the termites, they're going to be decomposed in no time. But up north, termites don't live. So those trees will lay there for maybe 20 or 30 years before they start to decay. Behind us we have a shag bark hickory, and that's the last tree I'll talk about here. I can see remnants of hickory nuts here on the ground. Hickory nuts are by far the, the most tasty nut, uh, I think, on the planet. Better than macadamia nuts, better than pecans. But that shag bark, and you can see it has exfoliating bark. The bark is peeling off in areas. Uh, the shag bark hickory is a tremendously good f uh, food for all sorts of wildlife. But if you try to look, this is our native red maple. And years ago, when they were uh, probably planning the, to build uh, uh, farms else. and something here on this campus, build uh, dormitories on this campus, they came and did a study on all of the trees and they tagged the trees. So here's a great example of a tree growing around a piece of metal. Uh, this, this is like a dog tag or a tree tag here.